Tonight, I'd like to tell you a story that took place about this same time last year in the lives of a missionary family, the Nelsons. And they were home on furlough visiting their supporting churches when their little six-year-old girl started running a high fever. After several doses of Tylenol didn't seem to help, little Katie was rushed to the emergency room. The ER doctor was stumped. And Dr. Conrad, the head of pediatrics, was called in. Katie's eight-year-old brother, Taylor, was eager to give his diagnosis. I know what's wrong with her, doctor. I'm sorry, son. I can't talk with you right now. But I had the same thing last month in Africa. You've been in Africa? Oh, yes, sir. That's where I live. Has this little girl been in Africa? Of course. She's my sister. And we're missionaries. And I was really sick, too. Mom and Dad said I almost died. What did you have? I forget what they called it. It had a really long, funny name. Mom probably remembers. Mom did remember, but that didn't solve Katie's problem. The virus was very rare and extremely serious. There was no known cure or treatment. Over the next few days, Dr. Conrad tried several different medicines, but nothing seemed to help. Katie just grew weaker. Mr. and Mrs. Nelson took turns being with Katie, but Taylor never left Katie's side. Whenever she was awake, Taylor was there trying to cheer her up. What are you doing, doctor? Just checking Katie's pulse. Does she feel okay? Uh, not really. She is going to be all right, isn't she? She's, uh, she's got a ways to go yet, son. Don't worry. She's going to be fine, because I've been praying for her. Have you been praying for her, Doctor? Uh, well, I'd like to, but I've been very busy. You're too busy then, because nothing's more important than prayer, especially at a time like this. I'll have to remember that. Please pray hard, Doctor. I love Katie just about more than anything in this whole world, and she's just got to get better. Katie was not improving. And Dr. Conrad started her on yet another antibiotic, hoping for some change in her condition. He was trying to find some medicine that would work before it was too late. As he slowly walked out of the room, the doctor found himself doing something he hadn't done in a long time. He silently whispered a prayer for Katie and Taylor. His prayer even surprised himself. You see, Right after his wife and son left him several months before, he gave up believing in prayer. In fact, he gave up believing in just about everything. As a boy, he'd been taught John 3.16, for God so loved the world. But that was many years ago, before he found out what life was really like. Later that afternoon, Dr. Conrad was surprised when a young visitor found the way into his office. Come in. Hi, are you busy? I'm afraid I am, son. I've got a meeting that starts in five minutes. Okay, I won't take long then. <laughs> I really do need to go. Wow, this is really a nice office. Thank you. Who's that? That's a picture of my son, Bradley. He kind of looks like me. <laughs> he sure does, doesn't he? He must be about the same age as you are. Can I meet him? I'm afraid not. He lives in Chicago with his mother. Chicago? Why? It's it's a long story, Taylor, and kind of hard to explain. But who plays ball with him and takes him fishing? Listen, son, I've really got to go, and you really shouldn't be in here at all. Okay, but just let me tell you one thing, Doctor. You've got to try to make Katie better by Sunday morning. Why is that? Because it's Easter, and we always have a family sunrise service on Easter. You can come, too. Taylor, I'm doing everything I can. But Katie is a very sick young lady. I know, Doctor, but Jesus is going to heal her, just like he healed me. I really hope he does, son. I know he's going to, because I've been praying real hard all the time. Do you know what today is, Doctor? Today? Uh, Friday. Not just any Friday, Doctor. It's Good Friday. The day Jesus died. And if he loved me enough to die on the cross, I know he loves me enough to answer my prayer.
Dr. Conrad had never had much time for love. He always had more important things on his mind. In fact, he was beginning to doubt that love really existed at all, with God or anyone else. Everyone he knew was in it for themselves. Yes, he did his best to help people with his medicine, but only because it furthered his career and gave him a comfortable living. Suddenly noticing the time, Dr. Conrad hurried off to his meeting with the hospital administration. For two hours, he discussed finances, profit margins, and other important issues. But for some reason, none of it seemed quite so important that day. When his wife left him, she said it was because he was married to the hospital and not to her. And he began to realize she was right. He never did have time for her or his son. Oh, he never meant to neglect them. It just sort of happened. But now his life was so empty, so cold and sterile, kind of like an operating room. When Dr. Conrad got back to his office, he found an envelope on his desk addressed to Bradley Conrad. Inside the envelope was a letter, painstakingly scrawled in the handwriting of an eight-year-old. Dear Bradley, Hi, my name is Taylor, and I'm eight years old. How old are you? Maybe we can be friends. I live in Africa, and I like to ride bikes and elephants. Your dad is real nice. He's helping Jesus make Katie better. Maybe you can come see me and your dad tomorrow. I'd like that. He'd like it too. I can tell he misses you when he talks about you. His eyes look sad. Well, I don't know what else to say, so goodbye. I love Jesus. I hope you love Jesus too, Taylor. The simple childish letter went straight to the doctor's heart. He read again. 
I can tell he misses you when he talks about you. His eyes look sad. Yes, he did miss his son. And his wife, too. Before he left the hospital, he stopped by to check on Katie one more time. Her condition seemed to be worsening. After giving her something for the pain, he hurried home to his computer to do some more research. He also called several colleagues to see if they had any advice. Although he got some new ideas, all of the treatments were experimental at best, and time was running out. After a short and troubled night's sleep, Dr. Conrad was back in the hospital by 8 o'clock Saturday morning. Katie had been in pain all night, and her vital signs were weakening. He again increased the dosages of her medicines, which were already dangerously high. Feeling helpless, he retreated to his office. A couple minutes later, his young visitor was back. Come in. Hi, doctor. Hi, Taylor. Have a seat. Katie's not doing so well, is she? I'm afraid not, son. We're doing all we can. I'm sorry. Yeah, I am too. I guess the disciples must have been pretty sad on Saturday too. <laughs> what? That's because they didn't know what was going to happen on Sunday. What are you talking about? Don't you remember? Jesus was in the tomb all day Saturday. I bet his mom was crying just like my mom is. You've got quite an imagination, Taylor. Imagination? Nothing! That's the Bible. And you know what happened next? What? Easter morning came, and all the crying stopped.
Dr. Conrad found himself caring deeply about Taylor. And perhaps it was because he missed his own son. But whatever the reason, he didn't want him to get hurt. They had to be prepared for the worst. Taylor, sometimes things happen that we don't understand. You mean like Katie getting sick and everything? Yes. Well, I've been thinking about that. And what were your thoughts? I think Katie got sick so I could come here and tell you about Jesus. Taylor, you can't keep living in a dream world. You're not a Christian, are you, Doctor? Son, when I was your age, I went to Sunday school, and I heard all the same Bible stories you have. And you asked Jesus to come live in your heart, too? I... I, I, don't, I don't remember. Doctor, Jesus died on the cross to take away your sin. But he won't do it if you don't ask him. <laughs> You'd make a good preacher. I'm serious, Doctor. Jesus loves you very much, and I love you too. And you need to get saved. Taylor, I appreciate your concern. I really do. But I think the one we need to worry about saving right now is Katie. But you're worse off than Katie, and you don't even know it. Taylor pulled a crumpled up gospel tract out of his pocket, threw it on the doctor's desk, and ran out of the room in tears. The doctor's heart was strangely moved by the boy's genuine concern for him. He silently longed for a life that was so simple, where the solution to every problem was the same, simply trust Jesus. But things just weren't that simple in real life. Nobody loved anybody enough to die for them, not even God. Suddenly, an urgent message over his intercom grabbed his attention. There was an emergency in room 612, Katie's room. He bolted out of his office and ran up two flights of stairs. Katie had stopped breathing. Everything was in a state of emergency. Buzzers were going off and nurses were scurrying about. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, Katie started breathing again. The emergency passed, but clearly her condition was deteriorating. Dr. Conrad again increased Katie's dosage of medicine. Her fever was still dangerously high and she was beginning to show signs of some internal bleeding. After advising Katie's parents that a blood transfusion would be necessary, the doctor went to the nurse's station to make the arrangements. Taylor was right behind him. Doctor? What is it now, Taylor? Does Katie really need some blood? Yes, she does. Then I want to give her mine. That won't be necessary, son. We've got a blood bank here that is well stocked. But I've already promised the Lord that I'd do it. Besides, I've got really strong blood. I got over the disease, didn't I? That's right. Perhaps the antibodies would help. Dr. Conrad hurried back to talk with Taylor's parents. Getting blood from a child donor was highly unusual, but they were running out of options. When the doctor found out that Taylor's blood was a perfect match with Katie's, he met with Taylor and his parents. Taylor, your parents have given their permission, but... I just wanted to make sure that you understood the procedure. I understand. Any questions? Well, is it going to hurt much? No. It's really quite painless, son. You'll feel a little prick in your arm when the needle goes in, but that's all. It'll be over, just like that. Are you sure this will help, Katie? I can't promise that, Taylor, but it's certainly worth a try. Well, okay then. I'm ready. It was clear to Dr. Conrad that Taylor, like most children, didn't like needles. Taylor soberly followed the doctor to a separate room where two nurses were preparing to take blood from their young donor. Taylor's eyes nervously darted about the room, searching for mom and dad, who had stayed behind to watch Katie. Dr. Conrad was as gentle as he could be, but Taylor still whimpered when he felt the needle. The blood was drawn quickly. Then the doctor hurried down the hall where he administered the blood to Katie, and the waiting began. Time was running out. No one was hungry for supper that Saturday evening. Outside the hospital window, clouds rolled in, signaling a change in the weather, and darkness came swiftly. As a spring storm released its fury, Mom and Dad were kneeling beside Katie's bed, pleading with God to save their little girl's life. Suddenly, a loud crack of thunder shook the room. It was an exclamation point sent directly from God. 
they were reminded that when Jesus walked on earth, he came to his disciples in the middle of a storm. Even as the thunder grew louder and the lights flickered, the Nelsons prayed that Jesus would once again come on the wings of the storm. Dr. Conrad spent the night catnapping on the couch in his office so he could check on Katie during the night. He was concerned that she might not make it till daybreak. Taylor and Mr. and Mrs. Nelson continued to pray while the lightning flashed and the thunder roared. As the morning began to dawn, the clouds started clearing. When Dr. Conrad entered the room at 7 a.m., mom and dad had fallen asleep in their chairs but little Taylor was lying right next to Katie with his arms around her. A single ray of sunlight was peeking through the window, illuminating the two children almost like God was shining heaven's spotlight on his two choice players in this earthly drama. 
When Dr. Conrad started to put his hand on Katie's forehead, Taylor's eyes popped open. Doctor, I stayed up all night and prayed for Katie. I didn't even fall asleep one time. Not even for a minute. That's good, Taylor. But I think it's about time you got some rest. How's our patient doing? I think she's doing better. She doesn't feel near as hot anymore. You're right, son. Her fever's coming down. I knew she'd get better by today, because that's what I've been praying. You know what today is, don't you, doctor? I sure do, Taylor. It's Resurrection Sunday. That's right. It's Easter. I guess you could say there were several resurrections that Easter. By mid-morning, Katie was sitting up in bed and smiling as her family had their sunrise service. A little late, but never more joyful. By the way, Dr. Conrad joined them for their service also. You see, something very unusual happened that night before. On Saturday evening, after Taylor had given blood and Katie had finished the blood transfusion, Dr. Conrad realized he had misplaced Katie's medical chart. So he went back to Taylor's room looking for it. When he opened the door, he saw Taylor lying motionless on the bed with big tears coming down his cheeks. A puzzled nurse was trying to comfort the young boy, explaining that they'd already taken his blood. Taylor, what's wrong? Is it time yet? Time for what? Time for it to be over. It is over, Taylor. I've already given your blood to Katie. But you said it would be over. Just like that. What do you mean, son? When am I going to die? Suddenly, Dr. Conrad realized what Taylor was thinking. Taylor thought he was giving all of his blood to save his little sister. For almost an hour, he had been lying very still, trying to be brave, just waiting to die. Overcome with emotion, Dr. Conrad gathered up Taylor in his arms and wept as he told him over and over again, you're going to be fine. We just took a little of your blood. You're going to be fine. Late Saturday night, the doctor slowly made his way back to his office, collapsed on the couch and closed his eyes. But his heart was in turmoil and his thoughts were racing. He couldn't get away from Taylor's willingness to sacrifice his life for someone he loved. The doctor knew that at that very moment, Taylor and his parents were praying for Katie and probably for him too. He walked over to his desk and found the crumpled up tract that Taylor had left for him. After soaking in every word of it, he fell to his knees and cried out to God to save him. Dr. Conrad, who had been dead in his sins, was resurrected that night to walk in newness of life. He came to Jesus as a little child, confessing a lifetime of sin and self-righteousness, and Jesus saved him. Well, that was a year ago, and a lot has changed since then. Now Dr. Conrad is back together with his wife and his son. And best of all, they've trusted Christ too. I guess you could say the whole family has experienced a resurrection. Isn't it amazing what the love of Jesus can do to change a life? But in order to really believe it, it sure helps to see it. Dr. Conrad had heard the story of God's love before. He had just never seen it lived out in anyone's life. But when he came face to face with a young man who genuinely loved the Lord and also loved others, the doctor saw more than just an eight-year-old boy, much more. He saw Jesus.
Yeah. 